is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Gravity Falls, Season 2, Episodes 18 and 19, Unpronounceable, and Weird Mageddon 2, Escape from Reality. In these two episodes, we get to see the weirdness of Bill's world, or what he's turned our world into, and we get to see the trap that he has laid for Mabel. It is a very enticing one. I get it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you very much to Melanie for commissioning this episode. I am Natasha. Melanie is here in the chat, and she says, no spoilers here, but I had to look up what XCPCVEAOQFOXSO meant, since I've always known this episode as Weird Mageddon Part 1. I looked it up, and it's a cipher for literally Weird Mageddon. Then just say that. I wonder if it's meant to serve as like the Rosetta Stone because there's so much code in this show. And maybe if it's meant to be Weird Mageddon, we're supposed to use those letters to like figure out what the code is altogether and then, you know, go back and figure out some of the other stuff because like there are a ton of episodes at the end of which there is some sort of like cipher or coded message at the bottom. And I'm very, very curious if those are going to wind up like being super meaningful or if they're just going to be fun little like, ha we did this little thing. It's funny, right? I'm curious about all of that. And I don't know if like, I wonder, is the show going to point those out to us or are those the kinds of Easter eggs that fans have to put work in to find out and otherwise they would never know, you know? Um, but anyway, guys, oh my God, I can't believe there's two more episodes left to this season. Um, Weird Mageddon three and four. So we're almost done. I don't know why I've covered several shows that only had like a couple seasons, i um, trying to think if there was ever a show I covered that only had the one season. I don't think that I've had that. Um, but I feel like I've grown more attached to this show for some reason than I have to a lot of others. I think because it just seems to have such a sense of fun. And that speaks to me. You know, there's a lot of prestige, very serious television out there. Um Austin says only one, right? I thought it was just a three parter. Oh, I don't know. There's when I'm looking at the, the menu right now on Disney plus there's episode 20, which says it's 24 minutes long and episode 21, which is 25 minutes long. Are those meant to be watched all at once? Or is that, are they two separate? Cause they're listed as two totally separate episodes. Um, but I don't know. Y'all, <laughs> y'all are going to have to, figure that out for me because I'm afraid I can't look into it. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I really am like going to miss this little world a lot. And I think that part of why like losing this show feels like such a shame is because there is still so much potential weirdness to explore. There are so many like cool things that they could do because they are willing to just go down whatever avenue and make fun or spoof on things that are, you know, near and dear to many of us. They're very cool with being outrageous and investing a lot into a particular genre or a particular like, and, and there is still so much remaining to be explored that I feel this is the first time 
a show has come to an end where I really am like, but there's still so much left to do. Normally, a show will either A, way outstay its welcome. And by the time it's done, you're like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's been time. Y'all need to stop. Or it will feel like, I can't believe that they ended it there like because you find out oh they didn't get renewed and so there's like a clear like break at a point where stuff should definitely have kept going they didn't finish explaining stuff i can't believe this and this show is like a weird the the story the overall arcing plot is clearly going to be wrapped up they planned for it to be two seasons so i'm not going to feel like i can't believe that they didn't renew it and it ended there but it also hasn't overstayed its welcome. So I'm in this place where I'm like, yeah, but you could have done more stuff just for fun. And we didn't need it to have to do with the overarching plot. And that's somewhat rare for me. When there, when I just want to see more of a show simply for the sake of the characters that are in it and having fallen in love with those characters, it's usually we've reached a point in the show where I have grown attached to them sheerly out of like the fun and the duration of the show. So for example, Parks and Rec, by the time that ended, I was in love with everybody on that show, but it was time. And gra like Gravity Falls, I feel like I've only really gotten to know everybody this season in a way that feels like affectionate for, you know, for everybody. Cause Seuss was the one that I had the hardest time getting on board with. Season one, I was sort of like, oh, I don't know about this character. Like, he's played for laughs, but I don't really think his line delivery is very good. The jokes that he says can be kind of obvious. And I feel like they were maybe just getting their footing with Seuss also. And that's another thing that can be really tough with comedy is you'll set up a thing and it won't quite work and you have to sort of figure it out. And it takes a little while to really do that in terms of like timing or writing and now I feel like they, they've really gotten to a stride where I know who everyone is, really know. And now I already have to say goodbye. And there's just, I feel like if there isn't a ton of Gravity Falls fanfic out there, there should be. Because this feels like a show that is ripe for that sort of thing. And... I there like there are so many characters that I'm going to be very sorry to never see again. Number one on that list for me is Grenda. I will just be devastated to not see Grenda anymore. Like she is such a weird, funny character that is embraced so completely for who she is and yet is still treated as a joke, but not in a cruel way. It's just so good. Um. So, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm already feeling sad about it, you know. So, OK, let's begin with Weird Mageddon Part One. And it begins very abruptly, right from where it had left off before with Bill floating in the air and deciding that he is going to take on a physical form and let in all his friends. And we see Blendon, who has, you know, Bill has just recently, like, jumped out of his body. And poor Blendon doesn't know what's going on and is looking around like, what the fuck just happened? And he sees Mabel get lifted into the air, put inside of a sphere with the, like, shooting star on it that is wrapped in chains. And he bounces the fuck out of there. And as we wind up finding out a little bit later, he goes and gets the time baby in order to put, you know, this dude Bill on notice. And Bill just straight up kills the time baby. Just vaporizes him. And I really enjoyed that all of Bill's friends are like, oh, no, you didn't. Because they just like, obviously, this is not a thing you fucking do. You know, I am... I I hate this so much, but I like Bill's friends a lot. I really do. <laughs> like, yeah, they're horrible, but God, they are really funny. 
And the design of them is funny and their names are funny. Ugh, it's well done. Oh, um, Austin says, I think I read Disney wanted there to be a third season, but the creator put his foot down. That's funny. What a weird thing to be like, no, I'm not doing any more of this beloved thing that's making money. Uh, Melanie says, there's a ton of merch, lots of which continues or adds to some story plot bits, <gasps> which reminds me, I meant to post this picture. I'll post it in the um, the Mighty Network later. But Melanie, Owen bought a dipper hat. He had been looking for one for ages. And they were all very cheap, shitty looking hats. He just was like, I mean, they have a tree on them, but otherwise they're just kind of crappy. And he finally found somebody making a really good looking one. And he bought it and like was putting it on and looked up and underneath the brim, there is a circle with tons of code and then another circle inside of that with a bunch of other code and then Bill, the triangle with the eye in the middle, like hidden under the brim off to the side. And I have not like, you know, looked at it hard or tried to figure out anything about it. But it was a fun little like Easter. It was not something that they advertised when they put the uh, photos of the hat online to sell. And it was a very fun surprise for him when he opened it to find that. So uh, I'll post the photo of it, but it's very cute. Um, so this is when Bill says, for one trillion years, I've been trapped in my own decaying dimension, waiting for a new universe to call my own. And he melts down the uh, statue of What's-His-Face, the founder of Gravity Falls. And he says, and now it's time to introduce you to the nightmares I call my friends. Eight Ball, Kryptos, the being whose name must never be said. Ah, what the heck? It's Xanthar. Then, of course, there's also Teeth, Keyhole, Hector Gun, Amorphous Shape, Aronica Pacifier, and these guys, which are basically just bat winged eyeballs. And I would love to know if like these nightmare friends are significant in some way to different people like who worked on the show, because there is something about them that feels really personal. And I don't know if I'm like projecting or what, but I could see you know, writers being like, all right, and then he's going to have a bunch of nightmare friends. They're not going to be super important, but they're each going to have their thing. And maybe each of the, you know, people who do the drawing or something each gets like a character that they're like, you can uh, maybe name this one. We'll prove the name and, uh, you know, give them a gimmick or something. And they just all kind of brainstorm together. I think that would be a really fun thing to do. Um, so <laughs> the, the, <laughs> The new mayor, uh, wh whose name I am forgetting, it's like Tucker Cute Biker, isn't that something like that? Um, he tries to stand up to Bill. He's a very like brave old dude for a second here, but Bill just turns him into stone, and that's the one thing this episode that like kind of you know was reassuring that the people who get taken up are turned into stone, which leaves a nice, like sort of back door for getting everybody saved in the end. But there's also another thing that happens. And, and I don't know if there is any saving this person. We have, Pacifica Northwest's dad attempting to throw in his lot with Bill. And Bill says, because <laughs> uh, he says, perhaps I can be one of your uh, horsemen of the apocalypse. And Bill says, oh, wow, that's a great offer. How about instead I shuffle the functions of every hole in your face? And then we have his nose appear on his ear. His ears appear where his eyes were, an eyeball coming out of his mouth, his nose entirely disappears. And I don't even want to, like, know what, like, 
there's other functions, there's other holes that thank God they were not involved. And it was just the face. That's all I'm saying. This was a nightmare, guys. I was so glad when I watched this with Owen later. And this part happens and he just went, Jesus fucking Christ. And I was like, right? It is crazy how this show can be like for children and like yet be absolutely so scary and upsetting. This, there's uh, that thing that like turns into fucked up versions of Dipper and Mabel in the, I can't remember what the name of the creature is. Um, there, But there's a lot of different things on this show that there's no blood or gore necessarily. It's just like a horrible series of things put together in such a way. Oh, this guy's face. I'm looking at it right now. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. And he like falls to the ground screaming. It's awful. It's very, very upsetting, guys. Um, so yeah, Deputy Durlin gets turned to stone. And then one of these uh, bats swings down and sort of like, almost like with the, what is that that you call like a force field or something that like, um, when you're watching stuff about aliens and they talk about how you were beamed up, it's like that. And that is how they're like carrying away all of these stone people, which they wind up putting together to make into a weird throne for Bill. Um, so yeah, Bill says it's time we do a little redecorating. I could really use a castle of some kind. And this fucking like fully formed ass pyramid that floats in the air just comes up. He says, how about some bubbles of pure madness? And those look really, really cool, to be honest. Um, the party never stops. Time is dead and meaning has no meaning. And there's a couple of birds that like stop floating, stop flying in midair, but they don't fall to the ground. They just stop. Um, and we see like the Gravity Falls water tower shrieking with its tongue sticking out. And then the intro begins and it all seems to be normal, but then it goes, there's a record scratch and it's all terrible. And I found this more upsetting than anything. It's one thing for things to go haywire in universe, but now you're fucking with the theme song, which is my universe fuck face. And I don't like it. I don't like any of this. Get out of here. This is not your territory, sir. Dislike, thumbs down. Even the fucking weather vane says Bill now. I love that 8-Ball has his moment with the candle like Dipper. Teeth and Keyhole and Hector Gun all have their little moments. I really, this is a very clever thing to do with the intro, actually. But I did still hate it, just FYI. Um, so... We have Great Uncle Ford and Dipper hanging out together, watching everything go terribly, terribly wrong. There's all these animals and gnomes. And one of those minotaur guys comes running out of the woods, getting the hell out of the way. And Dipper is really concerned about Mabel. And it's like, she has to be in danger. But Great Uncle Ford is like, we will go find her. I promise. But we've got to stop Bill first because if we get to her and try and save her, but he's able to like continue spreading this across the globe, saving her isn't really going to do any good. Like we, he's really the main issue here. And Dipper asks a very relevant question, which is, are you sure defeating Bill is even possible? Which good question, sir. That is a we should ask that. And Ford says, no, I'm not sure. But being a hero means fighting back even when it seems impossible. And <laughs> Dipper says that he will follow him to the ends of the earth. And Ford says, good, that's where we're heading. And then one of these gnomes pops up and says, weirdness wave. And we see it sweep over Seuss's front yard and his uh, grill comes to life and runs away. This huge uh, what looks like an octopus tentacle is just left sort of waving there 
And he says something to his abuelita. And when he turns to look at her, it turns out that she has become an armchair. It's honestly pretty good. Like her as an armchair with the little like doilies on her and everything. It is very, very cute. And Sue says, when the universe is broken, only one handyman can fix it. And we find out a little bit later that he is like, he, I think he says that there are like folk songs written about him. He's out here uh, doing the Lord's work and offering help to various strangers and whatnot. Um, so Grunkle Stan, we have like this one moment with him this episode, but we do not see what's happening with him until way later. He's talking to the goat, which basically gets uh, blown up to the size of a, what would one say, Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's very large. He's a large guy. Maybe even, maybe bigger than that, actually, because his head's like way above the trees a little bit later. Um, and we see him run away. And that's like all we know of about him until the end of the next episode. So then we go to prison. And we have Gideon, who has been assigned a finger painting project. And it's all about Mabel. Photos of Mabel. It says revenge and love, but there's a knife stabbed through it. It's all like tattered and torn up. Um, obviously, Ghost Eyes and his other friend, whose name I don't remember, they are defending him against the uh, finger painting teacher. And giant goat comes and bites off a corner of the prison and they all get free. And Gideon is very excited that Bill has held up his end of the bargain and he goes to essentially claim his prize is the way that he thinks about it. Um, meanwhile, Ford and Dipper are going to take their one shot at Bill with this gun. It's like, I don't even remember what this gun is. I love that it has a triangular target, though. But I don't remember what the function of the gun is, because I feel like it's sort of, it's said very quickly. Let's see. I'm, I'm rewinding it so that I can, although somebody in the chat's probably going to tell me before the rewind can tell me. Um, all right. So, yeah, they're in the bell tower behind Bill. La, da, 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 da. Ah, my quantum destabilizer. Been waiting a long time to use this. We are only going to have one chance to take this shot. He powers it up. He gets ready to fire. Bill is like right in the target. And all of a sudden, a bubble of madness swings over the roof. The bell behind him gets uh, turned into a sentient creature that yells about how it's alive now. He goes off his target just a tad and hits Bill in the hat. Bill's hat is full of meat. I do not like Bill's hat being literally a part of his body. Can I just go on record saying that? Makes me uncomfortable deeply. And it's not just like meat, like, oh, it's a brain up there. There's bones, too. You can see pieces of bone. Clearly, there's something more. Ha I don't like it at all. And it winds up just stitching itself back together. And Bill turns around and he blows the fucking steeple right off of the church. Great Uncle Ford is knocked down and trapped underneath some wreckage. And he shoves all of his uh, journals and everything to Dipper and says for him to run. But Dipper doesn't really run. He is. He tries to face off with Bill out on the street a little bit later. Uh, there's this moment that Bill uses to embarrass Ford where he has him like turn around and says, don't look so sour, Ford. See, it's not to, too late to join me with that extra finger. You'd fit right in with my freaks. Um, and he starts to say, I know your weakness, Bill. And he had started to say something to Dipper about 
what the one way to get Bill other than through this like quantum ray is. But of course he doesn't get it out all the way before he gets turned to stone also. And Dipper, when he does his confrontation with Bill, Bill says, go ahead, look through these journals, do one brilliant thing that takes me down right now. Everyone's waiting. Do it. And Dipper jumps and tries to punch Bill in the eye. Honestly, it was a pretty baller move. It didn't work. He gets thrown backward. It's a little embarrassing. However, pretty ballsy. I'm not going to say I'm not impressed. It didn't work, but that's not really the point. Like, shit, you know? And I felt so bad for Dipper in this moment because Ford, like, gave him all of these journals very purposefully, obviously with the intent of like, oh, this is a way to put to, to, like, there's a hint in here of the one way to take down Bill. And Bill gets all three of these fucking journals and lifts them into the air and lights them on fire. And this is one of those things that I should have probably seen coming. Because what you do with a hero's journey, inevitably, is you take away the thing that they have depended on this whole time, right? Like, that tends to be how that often works. And I should have realized that was going to probably be how things went. He depends on those for everything, you know, like all of his information about the weirdness and gravity falls has come from the journals. He's been obsessed with the author. Everything was about finding the other journals. And it makes total sense that like those being literally burned to nothing is what winds up happening so that he is going to have to rely on what he already knows and like his own intelligence to like piece things together by himself. Let's be honest, guys. When you've been going through a hard time and you feel a little bit lost, there is sometimes nothing more difficult than being told you've just got to figure something out by yourself. I can't tell y'all how goddamn tired I am. And I just need to reiterate, and I since no, I say this all the time. I don't even have kids. And I am fucking wiped out. Those of you who have children, I don't know how you do it. I really don't. Like, and Dipper's a child, a kid. And the weight of the world is like on his shoulders at this point. Not fair. I really feel for him. And granted, he has a team with him a little bit later. It's not going to be all on him. But I suspect it's going to be a lot on him. I'm sure he feels it, you know. And he told Ford that he would follow him to the ends of the earth. And Ford winds up getting gripped up so quick. And I got to be honest again, guys, I don't really like Ford very much. I'm not like anti-Ford. But he has not endeared himself to me. He just seems so self-obsessed and it it just sort of feels like he's bought into his own hype. You know what I mean? Um, So personally, when Ford gets taken away and just essentially completely taken out of play, I was kind of glad because this means that we are going to be with the old crew for I'm not sure how long they may be able to save Ford pretty quickly. But as of right now, I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to be the OGs that we know from the start of the show helping out and Ford isn't going to be part of that. And I'm honestly like pretty happy about it. I like this. So I just wanted to be honest about how I felt regarding this whole thing. Um, <laughs> so he says, Uh, Bill says, why did we come here? And eight ball says to get weird. And Bill tells eight ball that he deserves a treat and that he can have 
uh, dipper for a snack. And so can teeth. And then he fabricates a car out of like another car. He makes like this weird super souped up. Uh, <laughs> it's like spaceship isn't quite right. It's like a flying car, but it's more than that. And I love eight ball and teeth talking and able just being like, so do you want to eat them or something? And Teeth says, oh, definitely. Let's aid him. And then they just chase him down. Um, there's a moment where we look at, just as they're running away, one page of the the journal that is still like laying on the ground burning. And it says, do not summon at all costs. We see the uh, the this like diagram of the human brain and bill takes up one section of it. That's like kind of coming out of its skull. But then the other sections are cut into four parts, domestic, moral, reflectives, and the ladies. What is that about? Is that anything? Is that just a joke talking about like, oh, a big part of my mind is taken up with the ladies. Am I right? Because that's sort of what it feels like, but I don't know what to think of that. Um, okay, so let's talk about, okay, we're three days into this cataclysmic event. We see all of these people being turned to stone by these like bats that are flying around, these eyeball bats. And... What it is, is essentially anybody who's like out on the street is fair game. There's no particular reason to be turned to stone. It's not like, oh, if you follow the rules, you won't be turned to stone. And I really love that after I was like watching this kind of like, oh, there's no rules to this necessarily. Eventually, there is a moment where a dude has decided to sort of make it a religion about how like, oh, maybe Bill wants things to be triangle shaped. And then he realizes that uh, after preaching this, he's getting turned into stone anyway, and it doesn't matter. And honestly, that rang really true for me. <laughs> you kind of think you figured it out. Like, I, I guess this is what I do to have no bad things happen to me. And then a bad thing happens anyway. And you're like, oh, shit. Well, guess that wasn't it. And Dipper, he goes, he's like, you know, trying to uh, get some information together, find some other people that can help him. He isn't finding anyone. He doesn't know what's happened to everybody in town. And there is this giant head being dragged around by an arm through the streets that's trying to eat people. Uh, and I think, Austin, you were the one who said that it was originally Louis C.K. And after everything that happened, they wound up dubbing it with uh, the same dude who does um, Grunkle Stan's voice. But he sort of chases Dipper into the abandoned mall and Dipper runs into Wendy falling for a trap that she set. And he explains to them, to them, when I say them, he runs into Wendy and it turns out that Wendy is also here with uh, Toby Determined. And she says the eyeballs froze Nate. Lee, I'm trying to remember her friend's names. Oh my God, I forgot she's roasting a bat. Um, the eyeballs froze Nate, Lee, Tambry, and Thompson. Uh, and Robbie almost got away, but had to pause to take a selfie, which is pretty good. Dipper admits that he does not know where Mabel is. He doesn't know what the hell is going on with anybody. And he tells her about how upset Mabel was when he told her that he was going to be going, you know, doing this internship instead. And the, I really enjoy Wendy. She's like, you know what? We're going to figure this out. I've seen amazing shit, but nothing as amazing as you and your sister. I don't know if it's dumb luck or yin and yang or whatever, but when you two work together, there's nothing you two can't accomplish. You just need to make up and team up to save the universe. So just as he's saying, how will we ever find her? This giant monster rips a sign down 
that happens to be right in front of the weird sphere where Mabel is. And he sees that like the shooting star and knows immediately, oh my God, that's her. She's in there. And they steal a car. They get confronted as they're stealing this car by a team of sort of road warriors. And it's great. And there's also the whole thing going on with like spin the person with the uh, nightmare creatures that are in the pyramid palace. And there's like this like dance party happening. Honestly, this does look like a pretty sick party. I'm not even mad about it. And this is when the time police show up and time baby comes in, tries to lay down the law. And Bill literally is like, yeah, but what the fuck are you going to do? And absolutely dissolves everything everybody he says that the time baby says it could destroy the fabric of existence if you keep this up um bill again like i said does not care vaporizes everyone and all of his friends are like holy shit what did he do but they are very impressed and Blendon Blandon says this has gone from bad to worse as he's looking from behind a pillar and says, I got to get out of Dodge. And he bounces with his little uh, wrist thingy again. And I have no idea what to think about where he's going or what he plans to do, because he can easily go to a time before the time baby was killed just now. But really, what's the point? I mean, I don't know if that's who is going to like... Uh, the time maybe doesn't seem effective is what I'm saying. So what's the point in going and getting him again if he didn't do anything the first time? Um, so they go and steal this car. Poor Toby determined gets hit with a bunch of fucking like tranquilizer darts and goes down. <sighs> he's got this fucking mohawk, you guys. And he's wearing a shirt that says sassy girl. <laughs> What I, I just I really enjoy the line from Mabel, maybe last season it might have been, where she says to him, I always forget how weird you are, because that is absolutely correct. Toby is like just this like weird sleeper character where you know that he's pathetic and just generally a loser, but you forget about the strangeness that goes along with that. He's not your everyday run-of-the-mill loser. He's a real specific, special kind of loser. Um, so it turns out that this, uh, this gang of sort of road warriors is led by fucking Gideon. And... Essentially, he's going to he's trying to be like my sweet, precious Mabel's trapped inside. I have the only key uh, strung around my. Well, I wouldn't call it a neck wrapped around this little pocket of fat under my head. I swear to God. That might be one of the best line deliveries of this show. Just the way that is said is so fucking hilarious. I have quoted it several times since watching this episode for the first time i don't I just fucking this little pocket of fat under my head <laughs> oh my god it's so good um so yeah his whole plan basically is like oh yeah i'm just gonna wait until mabel likes me and then i'll let her out i guess um and Dipper very rightfully is like, dude, you have to know that there is no way she is going to like you after doing everything that has happened that you have done here. Um, now that I have her in a cage, she'll learn to love me. I have an eternity to wait. And Dipper winds up being pretty convincing here. Uh, Wendy says this isn't going to work. First of all, this is so good. Dipper convinces him after this, but I was totally willing to give this a shot first. She says, 
after I break Ghost Eye's arm and steal that key from your neck, I'm going to wear your butt on my foot like a rhinestone slipper. And she flips backwards, does indeed break Ghost Eye's arm, Dipper falls and trips him. They run up to Gideon and take the key from around his neck and she punts him like a fucking soccer ball and he goes flying after they steal what looks like an abandoned cop car and it is wonderful (laughs) dipper says wendy you are the coolest person i know and she says i know dude tell me about it later and then just hits the the gas and it looks like they're gonna get away there's a pretty good chase spoiler they do not get away They wind up getting caught up with. However, there is a pretty sick montage of them flying through a bunch of bubbles of madness and all of the different versions of them that we get to see. So first, there are a couple of bird versions of the two of them. Then they go through one that's them like kind of like uh, uh, anime. Then we've got them made out of like pieces of meat bacon, steaks, sausages, all this stuff. Then there's one where they are the actual voice actors and they are, it's a live action moment. Uh, And then we come back out on the other side of it again. And it was just a good time. We see Gideon and Ghost Eyes and they have like this weird sort of, it's not even 8-bit, I don't know what to call it. It's like one of those like 90s 3D renderings that's very angular. Um, then we have like a version of them that sort of almost looks like they're characters from, uh, from, oh my God, a John Waters film, which I don't know if that's really what that is, but it just has that look to it to me. Maybe it's the wigs. And then there's the, uh, the silent cartoon with the, like it's, you know, there's music playing and then it just cuts to a screen where it just says, ah, on it. Um, but yeah, eventually we get to the point where Dipper says to Gideon, or they run into Seuss, but he says to Gideon, you know that the way to get Mabel to like you is not to do this kind of shit. If you want her to like you, if you want to be loved, you have to turn into somebody lovable. That's how it works. You can't make a person love you. The best you can do is strive to be someone worthy of loving. And Gideon tries to say that he's worthy of loving. But Dipper's like, yeah, but you're really selfish. And she knows that. And if you work with me to fight back, maybe that would turn you into somebody that she likes. And understandably, Gideon is very worried about what Bill would do if he turns around and betrays him. But Ghost Eyes gives him a look and says, are you afraid of Bill? In this sort of like combo, disbelieving, disappointed voice. And he really backpedals and is like, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, not no, though, either. It's a complicated situation. Dipper says, if all this is for Mabel, ask yourself what Mabel would want you to do. And he pulls out the uh, feature from the newspaper that says little Gideon's little girlfriend and looks at the two photos of Mabel and him together and realizes that she does not look happy in either photo and and like sort of seems to like it, it comes to him oh, I don't want her looking like this when she's with me. I do want her to be somebody that she like would like to be around. And so he indeed does decide to throw his lot in with them. I love when he tells all the prisoners that they are going to team up with, uh, with Dipper. And one of them says, yeah, we're with you. Fighting, uh, fighting children is boring. I think he says, hold on, I'm finding it. Ghost Eyes says, we're with you all the way, brother. 
Um, and the other dude says, we're, we're behind you for life, brother. Fighting children is boring. Fighting a chaos god sounds fun. That's fair. And so they head on over to the bubble. And they walk into the bubble. And then that was the end of the episode. And I cannot tell you all how relieved I was that Melanie commissioned the second one of the two. Because if it just stopped there for me, I would have been... I would have been agitated, y'all. I would have been agitated. <laughs> so then we go on to Weird Mageddon 2, Escape from Reality, which is really something. So we start off with the guy with the sandwich board that I was talking about, uh, who says that, you know, cut things into triangles. Um, an object with more than three sides is sinful. That's it. That's probably what Bill wants. <laughs> But then he and uh, Wendy's dad both get turned to stone. We go back to the weird dance party that's going on in Bill's palace. And Bill is making a speech. Tapping on... He uses a fork and taps it on Great Uncle Ford in order to uh, get everybody's attention. Like he's a champagne glass or something. Um... I should mention that the doll of Great Uncle Ford has a mustache. Did he draw a mustache on the statue? Is that, was he just being petty and he drew a mustache on him? Because that's hilarious. Uh, okay. So. He's talking to all of them about how they've made this uh, massive throne of human agony and everybody celebrate. This dimension is ours. Go out and conquer the rest of the world. And they're like, sweet, let's go. And they fly out of there all full speed ahead. But they hit some weird barrier. And Bill is taken quite by surprise. He says, this might be more complicated than I thought and looks down and like his friends are kind of hurt. A couple of them, like, I'm sure they'll be fine, but they hit that shit hard. And you can see that he was just not expecting to run into any sort of obstacle here at all. My question is whether or not this like alien spacecraft that landed here created a kind of barrier for them somehow. And maybe that's why they came in the first place was that like they found out that there was going to be some dimension melting creature that came through from somewhere else and that it needed to be trapped. And they were like, well, why don't we just uh, crash our spaceship there real quick and get that taken care of. But I have nothing to back any of that up. It's just pure conjecture for the fun of it. So let's go to our lovely people in Mabel's prison. Seuss, Dipper and Wendy walk into a white void. There is nothing around them that they can see. All of a sudden, the floor begins to crack around them, and it's like a rainbow, like crack. And as they fall, it's clearly like glittery rainbow background. It looks almost like, uh, have you guys ever done like that sand painting? Or uh, what are they called when you pour different colors of sand into a tube to make a pattern? Y'all do not even know how much I loved that kind of shit when I was a kid. I loved those little like sand th and they were so expensive and so stupid. And if you shook them up, it would just turn brown. So you just have to be really careful with them and treat them. But I loved that shit. I just I can't I can't express to you all. What a sucker I was for things like that when we would go to, like, the state fair. And I would just want to do them so bad. You know what? Next time I go to a fair like that, I am absolutely going to make one of those. Just because I can. Because my parents never let me. I think I was allowed to do it once. And I wasn't even allowed to do, like, a container that was as big. I got, like, the smallest one. And I felt very ripped off. Um, but anyway, they wind up landing on a bouncy castle. And as soon... As the cracks form under their feet and the cracks are rainbow, what this turns out to be is what I began to suspect. 
that this is going to be an ideal Mabel world and she isn't going to want to leave. So there's 80s music playing. Apparently it smells like childlike wonder. They turn and look out over the, uh, the landscape and all of them go, whoa, because first of all, we have the very muscular dolphin flying by that shoots rainbows out of its mouths because there's also mouths on its hands. Truly a creature of nightmare. Don't care how it's drawn. Horrifying. In the background, you can see people who are like dancing on a floating island that's under a giant disco ball. There's a ball of yarn with two giant knitting needles stuck into it and two like uh, huge, what are they called? Things of thread, spools, spools of thread on either side, flanking the doors inside. And like the buildings behind it are like socks and sock puppets. There's a hamburger house. There are hills with just a straight up heart punched through the middle. There's a lot happening here. And up pops this boy that Mabel had sent that question to. Uh, Do you like me? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. And he holds that up to them. (laughs) Oh my God, I forgot about this clock tower. I really need to see what it says on this. I love being able to do this with the show guys and like press pause and read all of the little things. Okay, so the clock just says it's divided into four parts and on each part it says summer and on each uh, part the sun is like completely out. There's, you know, like a little weather predictor and it's just like, oh, it's going to be sunny and summer all the time. There are balloons of clowns, of teddy bears. There are birds that are actually Mabel's sweaters flying around. We have that giant star with the uh, tiny little 80s shorts on that was from that one really weird episode. I forgot about that, actually. Uh, And a traffic sign that says 60 smiles per hour. And I just, all, there's just so much going on here, guys. I can't, I want to talk about every single little thing. There's a, uh, what do you call it? A signal like for a, when to cross the street, but it tells you when to hug people. Waddles is walking around like a giant bus, like public transport with lights shining out of his eyes, like headlights. And I just, there's so much. It's just so much. Um, The two dudes who I don't think we ever get their names, do we? Maybe we do. But, you know, the two cool guys are here in their amazing fucking uh, convertible with a license plate on the front that just says cool. Now who wants to go on the grand tour? Do we have a choice? <laughs> no. Mabelland is the ultimate paradise and the only rule. There are no rules except for one rule, which is very serious, but no one would ever break it. So it's not worth mentioning. Yeah. Oh, I love it. This is so exciting. Guys, this whole episode is just so chock full of greatness. I'm just, this must be so much fun to do. Like, I wonder about how much of it is pure memory. Do writers think back just in their minds and go, oh, do you remember that episode where we did such and such? We should bring that back. Or do they keep a list of things? Or do they go back and rewatch episodes for ideas and go, oh, I forgot about that. No, we definitely need to include that. Like, it could be one of so many different things, you know? I I can't imagine that they just remember everything because I know with me, with this show, people will be like, what did you mean when you said such and such about a show that I literally posted yesterday and I have no idea what they're asking me? I don't know what they're talking... Like, when you produce a lot of stuff, you just lose track. It's just, that's how it goes. So 
I just I have to imagine that they just go back and rewatch things, you know. Um, so <laughs> I I love this car like flying down the streets and eventually winding up on this amazing beach. Um, now come have rad snacks served by awesome penguins, and they have all of this food. And I was very curious because they're about to they they cheers each other and they begin to take a sip. And Dipper stops them and says, don't forget that this world was created by Bill. The drink is probably blood. The glitter rain is probably ground up bones or babies or something. And I was very glad that he was keeping his head throughout all of this. He winds like we wind up seeing the, the world fall apart in front of our very eyes. And it is as horrifying as he says. But in the moment, my main concern was just, what if they drink it? And it's not even that it's like poison or blood or anything like that. What if it keeps you here? What if it's like fucking the underworld or accepting something from a fairy? You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, he says, Bill's obviously using Mabel's own fantasies as some sick trap. We need to grab Mabel and get the heck out of here. So we go to Mabel's house and I love that they're all like worried about these guards that they think have Mabel trapped, but it turns out that they are her servants and do as she says. She can literally like, uh, she claps their hands and stops them from like attacking and she can lift things and move them with her mind. And she says, I made this world. Well, I sort of woke up here. It's complicated. And she turns this like name black around and it says Mayor Mabel. And she says, this is my world and I don't want to be saved. Ah, uh, Mabel. Look, I'm not even like mad at you because... Lord knows we get precious little goodness in the world. And if somebody just gives you a huge illusion of goodness, I mean, maybe that's not so bad. I don't know. I get it is what I'm saying. Um, and she says when Dipper argues with her about how she really has to go, she says, I've prepared a backup Dipper who's more supportive. And this kid comes sweeping in on his skateboard, introduces himself as Dippy Fresh. He's also wearing a vest, but it has lightning bolts on it. He has electric green square sunglasses. I like skateboarding, supporting my sister and punctuating every sentence with a high five. And he holds his hand up and Dipper looks at Seuss like, don't you dare, dude. And I love that Seuss says, I can't leave him hanging and does it anyway. And Dipper's response is, you're dead to me, Seuss. <laughs> uh, moments in this show where somebody is unexpectedly harsh are very, very good. <laughs> um, so Mabel says, trust me, you guys are going to love it here. This world always knows what you want before you do. And as she is saying this, we have the examples shown to us. So first there's Wendy and her friends turn up and tell her that they are going to glue a plunger to the principal's head. And she is so excited. And she says, sorry, guys, I've always wanted to do that. I'll be back in just a few minutes. And she takes off with all of her apparent friends. And Seuss says, there's nothing in this world that could break me from our mission. But then this dude comes through the door. He is in a luchador mask wearing, you know, the wrestling pants with the big fucking belt. And it says Poppy on it. And he says, Seuss, mi hijo, I have returned. Seuss <laughs> says, Dad, he says, you don't remember what I look like. So I had the body of a pro wrestler and the face you once saw on a hot sauce bottle. I was never there for you, but in this world, I can be. Oh my God. 
and the face you saw on a hot sauce bottle. <laughs> oh my god. That fucking got me really bad. <laughs> Ah, oh, and Dipper's like, dude, what can you do? But his dad says, do you want to play catch? And Sue says, I'm sorry, dude, even if this isn't real, I've got to play at least one game. And Dipper at this point is really mad and is yelling at Mabel. Do you really think that this is healthy for people? And she's like, you, ha you have to see how happy everybody is. Like... That's, you can't argue with that. People are objectively having a good time here. And she says, Mabel Land has something for everyone, even you. And the doors begin to open and lights pouring out. And he says, nope, nope, not doing it. And he runs away. But what I expected was going to, like, if you have made me guess, my first guess was going to be something to do with Wendy. And that does indeed turn out to be a thing. I don't know if it's specifically what was behind those doors, but it definitely is a weapon that gets pulled on him a little bit later. Um, so we have Bill and he's throwing a tantrum over the fact that they can't get out of the borders of this area. And one of his uh, like henchmen, the one with the keyhole in his head um, comes to tell him Gideon let the Pines family escape. They're inside Mabel's bubble as we speak, excuse me, as we speak. And he says Mabel's bubble is the most diabolical trap I've ever created. It would take a will of titanium not to give into its temptations. Fetch me Gideon and take the rest of the day off. Things just got a little more interesting. So we go back inside. There's this fucking terrifying tree, guys. Terrifying. I mean, and I'm, I'm saying it's terrifying long before what winds up happening in a second. Booba doo doo. I'm a stuffed animal tree. He's a stuffed animal tree. We're the stuffed animals. Tee hee hee. Oh my god. <laughs> so. This is when Wendy shows up, allegedly, and she tells him, I think you're right about this. Um, I like hanging out with my friends, got old quick. The music that's playing is starting to get on my nerves. And he's, you know, worried about how things are going. And she's telling him, don't worry you always think of something. You're so much smarter than anyone else. It's funny. If you were older, you'd be like my dream guy. And she says, in this place, you could be any age you want. If we were the same age, maybe we could actually be together. And he sits up and says, wait, really? And she says, if you ask Mabel, I bet you could do it right now. Come on, man. Just take my hand. And Thank God Dipper keeps his head. He realizes and says, wait a minute, this isn't real. And just as he says that, her hand turns into a bunch of bugs. Her face turns into a bunch of bugs. She dissolves into a bunch of bugs. And then the stuffed animal tree turns around with its horrible mouth and says, you shouldn't have done that, Dipper. We're watching you. There are eyes everywhere. Oh, my God, you guys. I hated it so much. I hated it so much. I hated it so much. All of a sudden, it's over. And the guys from several times just ride by on a very long bicycle that they're all sharing. And he turns back to the tree and it's still singing Buddha doo doo on the stuffed animal tree like nothing ever happened. And I feel so bad for Dipper because like he gets confirmation that he's absolutely right. 
and nobody is going to fucking believe him. So he's standing there and he's yelling about how I have to convince Mabel to go back to the real world. And just as he says that, everything stops and all of these people turn and look at him. And by people, I mean waffles, penguins, stuffed animals, tigers, a thing in a top hat. Under article smiley face of exhibit squeaky duck, you are hereby accused of breaking our one rule, mentioning reality. Prepare to be banished from this land forever. And Dipper says, Mabel, come on. Are you really going to let them do this? And she says, no, of course not. That's my brother, guys. There's got to be another way. So they decide to let him plead his case in the trial of fantasy versus reality. And I loved that this is what, because like the two of them really are each like Mabel and Dipper each do very much represent those two, you know, the dichotomy of fantasy and reality and of joy and, I don't want to say sorrow, but like naivety, I guess, and clarity. Um, Melanie says, remember the bunker episode? Remember how Dipper realized which was the real Wendy? I don't remember. Was it something about taking his hand? I don't remember. Help me, Melanie. Help. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, because, like, I remember, let's see, a wink versus mouthing, zipping lips closed. I thought it was a good callback. Does she give him a wink here? I didn't even see that. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, Melanie. It is a good callback if you notice it, but evidently... It was lost on me. My apologies. <laughs> um, so Mabel tries to tell Dipper that it's not up to her. She doesn't make the rules. And he says, yes, you did. There's a tapestry of you making the rules. And we see it hanging up. And it's amazing. Um, so we get the Honorable Judge Kitty Kitty Meow Meow something something who... Climbs up and begins the trial, right meow. <laughs> and basically what it comes down to is if Dipper wins, Mabel will come with back with him to the real world. But if he loses, he will be banished forever and be replaced with town darling Dippy Fresh. Dippy, come on out. Flip a dip dip. Oh my god. <laughs> Dipper, I hate him so much. Um so the jury, as it turns out, are six Mabels that are all sitting in different colored sweaters with different colored uh uh pillows behind them. And Dipper's like, alright, you know what? This is ridiculous, but if you want to do this, then this is what we shall do. And they have the two cool guys who I'd like to show you this reality that Dipper loves so much and show you how it has wronged my client and Dipper their entire lives. Exhibit A, Mabel's Scrapbook, second grade, October 10th. And so we see some really like bummer memories. There is Mabel getting very excited for her school photo. And she's wearing a bunch of slap bracelets up and down her arms and her hair in pigtails. And some girl walks by and puts gum in her hair. And she looks at Dipper and says, Dipper, what do I do? And he doesn't know what to say to her. And she just runs away crying. And, I kind of thought 
I didn't realize initially that what the point is, is just like the world is mean and hard. And I thought what it was supposed to be was like that Dipper failed her. And I kind of like got defensive because I was like, what is he supposed to? He's also a kid and he can't just like fix, you know, things for you. He can be supportive, but that's not the same thing. And then it turns out that's exactly right. What it what we see is a continuation later of those memories in which Dipper comes a- around to be supportive of her. Um, so then we have another memory of Dipper not getting any Valentine's on Valentine's Day. And some dude saying, Dipstick didn't get any. I thought I was a class loser. And him running out of class, very embarrassed, and knocking over a garbage can and just feeling like an idiot. And somebody nudging Mabel and being like, I can't believe that kid, your brother. Ugh. Um, and then they like, you know, show him all of the bad things that have happened since and ask him whether reality has done him any favors. So then when Dipper gets his say, he says, I understand it. You're scared of growing up. I'm scared too, but this is how life works. Sometimes it sucks. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a better way to get through it than denial. And that's with the help of people who care about you. It's how we've gotten through our whole lives. And so we see Mabel standing ready to get her school photo taken and tears in her eyes. And he comes running up and he says, I found a way to get your, uh, like to make your school photo perfect. And he takes out a fucking electric razor and just buzzes through the middle of his own head. And she laughs and says, you're crazy. And then she takes it and buzzes through hers too. And they get their photo taken together. (laughs) And honestly, that is some ride or die shit kids. If somebody is willing to like shave their head for you on your behalf, that's meaningful. And then we go to the memory post Valentine's day and Mabel has taped together all of the Valentine's that she got for Valentine's day into a giant heart and then written on the back for my brother, for my favorite brother from Mabel. And it's just a really sweet little moment. And he says, we've always been there for each other. And we see some things from before we knew them and then some things from the actual show. And he says, I thought I was going to be here and be Ford's apprentice, spend my teen years cooped up in a basement with a lab coat. How ridiculous is that? I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but whatever it is, You don't have to fear because we'll do it together. I'm not taking Ford's apprenticeship. We've traveled to heck and back to get you and we're going back together. Leave this fantasy world. Let's beat Bill and grow up together. And I have to say that I really felt a way about this being the like apparent solution that he was going to give up this apprenticeship that seemed to mean a lot to him. Um, And I was grateful that later on, there's a real moment of Mabel being like, you know what, buddy, I want you to do what makes you happy. So if you really want to do that apprenticeship, I'm not going to hold that against you because, you know, I don't want this to be a story about, how you have to give up on your own dreams because somebody else refuses to come to terms with the fact that things change and you want something of your own. But I also really did not like the idea of Dipper dropping out of school in order to hang out with fucking Ford full time. I I was not on board with that either. So I had a very like mixed reaction to this and I was relieved that the show gave Dipper some room to have this be an actual like choice rather than feeling forced into it the way that he does, you know? 
So, yeah, they have their their sincere sibling hug. And as they do, everything around them begins to disappear. Um, and Mabel says something about how, you know, she needs she starts to like clap in order to calm down the judge, but it does not work. And she begins to realize that the uh, power she was given, the, the her reign over the land is over now. And all of the things in this world begin to turn into like these dark, terrifying versions of themselves. And the only exception are the two cool guys who, for some reason, don't change over the way that everybody else does. But they escape on Waddles' back. I love it so much. Um, they're being chased by like this crowd that is led by the luchador. Mabel has the, the giant knitting needle sitting there and she grabs one of them and uses it to poke a hole in the prison. And it pops with a bunch of confetti flying everywhere. And they get out and Waddles shrinks down to his original size. And this is when she says, if you want to take his apprenticeship, I won't get in your way. And he says, and miss out on your awkward teen years, you wish. Um, and I just appreciated this being added in, you know, like I, I needed it. And she says something like, all right, well, real world, how bad can it be? But then she turns and she sees the absolute total destruction that has been wrought. And she's like, oh, <laughs> Never mind, I take it back. But they get back to the mystery shack. And it looks like everything is totally fine. So they run up onto the porch and they start to open the door, but they hear somebody inside and they're like, oh God, oh God, who is it? And they all get their their weapons ready. Mabel with her grappling hook, Dipper with a uh, golf club. But it turns out that it's a, uh, a crowd of our old favorites from town, of course, headed up by Grunkle Stan, naturally. Um, we have the guy who, like, married a falcon. Was it a falcon or an eagle? I can't remember what it was. Um, I'm trying to see who. All oh, my God. The unicorn is here. Shit. I didn't see that. Is that Grenda with war paint and goggles on? Awesome. Candy, is she here? There she is. Candy's also got goggles on. Nice. Uh, Pacifica Northwest is here. Old man McGucket. Uh, what is the name of the fat black cop? He's here. A few gnomes. And one of the uh, the minotaur man. The manators. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we've got a pretty good crew here. Oh my god. And then the uh, multi-bear. <laughs> comes out and says, hey, we're out of toilet paper. <laughs> I forgot about the multi-bear. That's a pretty weird one. And then we go to the uh, credit sequence where the two cool guys say, whoa, we survived as they climb out of a pile of confetti. And they sit on a bench contemplating the nature of their reality and their place in it. Um, every existing thing is born without reason, prolongs itself out of weakness and dies by chance. Totally righteous, bro. I know. And that's the end of the episode. So yeah, that was a lot, y'all. <laughs> that was packed. Um, I'm going to ask Melanie because she's in the chat right now. The next two episodes, I'm watching them separately, right? They are not going to be like another back to back twofer. Um, I won't mind if they are. I just wanted to clarify. I haven't checked. But yeah, I don't. I have no idea what Bill's weakness could be. I have no idea if that even like matters. It. I feel like it has to be something to do with that spaceship. The spaceship being added to the equation so quick is kind of confusing to me. Hmm. Wait a minute. Melanie says only one left part three. So then it is back because I was just saying this to Austin. There are two 
left, according to Disney Plus. So if Disney Plus divides them, watch both. Okay, gotcha. So it is a, a twofer. All right. Um, man, but that's a live watch. So I'll watch both for the live watch. Um, I don't... I have no idea what could be coming. I really don't. I keep trying to think of like a theory. It's just too bonkers, man. Everything is so wacky for lack of a better word that I like it's totally unpredictable to me I have no idea I can't like they just did such random shit these past two episodes and I I can't decide whether like what goes on with Bill is going to be like the point even because I, I Bill's obviously the big bad that's not I don't mean that like oh is there somebody else secretly I just mean I don't know if like the final battle against Bill is going to take up the next whole two episodes or uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I still have some minutes left on this, but I don't really have much more to say about the episodes themselves. Is there anything that you guys wanted to ask me before I, I wrap it up? But thank you, Melanie, for giving me extra time to talk about these because I clearly needed it. So I don't know if the next episode will be extra long also, but I guess we shall see how much I have to say about those. I'm just like, there's a part of me that low key, I want Bill defeated, but I want his friends to stay and be like part of the mystery shack team. <laughs> I really want eight ball who is like the funniest design to stick around. I just really enjoy him. What a weird creature. Um, or Xanthar. Xanthar's too big. He just he wouldn't fit in the house. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again to Melanie for commissioning these. Uh, oh, thank you, Kyle said earlier. Xylar and Kraz are the names of the two cool guys, which is amazing. Um, she says, do you want Cypher talk over on Mighty Network slash Facebook after the recordings for the finale goes up? Sure. If you have information on that stuff, yeah, definitely. I would be interested in hearing all about that because I'm very curious about what meant what and what I missed or yeah, definitely. Cool. I'm looking forward to all of that being revealed. All right, guys. Well, I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. And until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.